What attracted me? Oh, I've never had to sit down and analyze all these things like this. I've never done it. I mean, it seems to have just happened. It, it seems to have just been right. Desmond has always behaved as if he's years older than me. He's only two years my senior. And he's always sort of played the big brother. He's always been protective. He's always been the first to forgive if we come into a quarrel. And whether it's his fault or my fault, he'll be the first one uh, to apologize and say, let's talk about it. The truth is, I don't know when it starts, but you know, the road is long as you travel it. The longer you go, the more dependent you are on the other. Actually, I think I loved Desmond long before he loved me. <laughs> My first impression of him, because I thought he was quite a nice looking young man. I would have liked to go out with, but uh, I don't think he noticed me at all. Uh, she, she says I, I hardly noticed her, uh, but I did, I did notice her. He was just a stuck-up uh, headmaster's son. She, she usually says that I was uh, sort of hoity-toity. And you talk about boys with friends and you say, oh, he's handsome, oh, he's all right, oh, he's, oh, he's stuck-up. As the only son, my parents want, obviously wanted me to get married. It was actually a very a sneaky way he caught me. My older sister uh, said she really didn't like the person that I, I had thought I was going to get married to. So I said, OK, uh, who is the person that you'd want? And my young, it was a, my younger sister who said, uh, Leia. He didn't have one girlfriend, so I said, there's Leah, get married to Leah. He knew I was about to finish um, at college and start teaching. We were friends, and again, my father loved this girl because she was so brilliant, and my father used to call her a genius. I wrote her a note uh, to say, could she come to my home? He's got some news about a teaching post. And you see, my father was a principal. I rushed to go and hear about this teaching post. And she really looked dashing. She, 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 she had a, an hourglass figure. I can still see him in, in my mind's eye. And yeah, there she was wearing a green dress with a, with a blue beret. She had a, a particular way of wearing uh, her beret. I think she must have been shocked. <laughs> And there was no teaching post that he'd known about. He just wanted us to chat. <laughs> I said to her, I've got to get married. <laughs> you know, my parents want me to get married. I thought, it's a strange way of proposing if he is proposing. That was not too romantic. Our generations, we look at all sorts of things. He came from a good home. He had good parents and he was polite. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll help you be an obedient boy to your parents. I'll marry you. <laughs> I had to borrow the money uh, to get my lobola, you know, and I fortunately I borrowed, borrowed it from a, a religious community. They couldn't say they wanted to have a share in her. We got married on the 2nd of July, obviously, 1955. It was the very true African wedding. He was smashing on that day. Desmond looked really very handsome. We didn't have money for a honeymoon. <laughs> In fact, I think we still owed money for our wedding attire. <laughs> I had married a poor man. I was poor and married a poor man. 
and I wasn't expecting to get things from him. I was expecting us to work and get things for ourselves. The newlyweds set up home in Munsiville, around the corner from Desmond's parents. But it was the era of so-called Bantu education. Frustrated, in protest, both Leia and Desmond left the teaching profession. Desmond turned to the church. Leia studied nursing. Blessed with their first child, Trevor was born. It was tough times for the young couple starting out at number 503A, Mahali Street. It was a three-roomed house, one, two, three rooms. The wall between the dining room and our bedroom didn't go right up to the ceiling, so that the light had to be for both sides, for the right dining room and the bedroom. <laughs> And these were the better ones, you know. We were the sentin of Mansiville. <laughs> We've had some very interesting times. We lived in a backyard, and it wasn't even a, a, a room. We lived in, in the garage. The first time we went to England, when I was a student, and our allowance was so small, I couldn't pay the, the milkman. I crept under the bed and said to Leia, <laughs> When we struggled for worldly goods, it was tough. But you see, we struggled together. Desmond has been very good with the children. He used to bath the children all the time. He can't cook, and that's the last thing you should ask him to do. <laughs> You can ask him to wash dishes and, uh, you know, wash pots, but don't ask him to cook. With the cooking securely in Leia's hands, Desmond excelled in his calling within the Anglican Church. By 1966, returning from four years' study in London, back in apartheid South Africa, Desmond and Leia were making frequent road trips, taking and fetching now three children from Waterford College in Swaziland. Trevor, the oldest, was 10 at the time. One day, we were coming back from Swaziland, and we were crossing the border, the Lesotho border. Tandi was in front, Trevor was behind Tandi. There was a young white policeman who was doing the stamping and uh, sorting through the passport. He did uh, Tandi's passport and sort of threw it like that. And he threw my mother's passport at her for no apparent reason. Trevor got very upset about this. I asked him what sort of idiot he thought he was. I mean, at the age of 10, I was arrested. They then dragged Trevor in, and I followed in. I said, you can't take him, he's underage. You can't take him without me being there. And they said, you want, we're going to, 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 to arrest you for trespassing if I go through. They were sent off for the captain of that border post. And I mean, this guy came in and he was enormous. He questioned me and they called him my father. And his parting comment was, in my eyes as he'd walked into the room, he had never seen so much hatred. And I was thinking to myself, my buddy, you do not know the difference between fear and hatred. <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning of our problems with the children. Each time we approached borders, I mean, you could see that the children were becoming very uneasy. In 1972, Desmond took a position with the World Council of Churches, and the family relocated and settled in London. It was a welcome respite from the shackles of apartheid South Africa. The freedom was short-lived. Three years later, Desmond accepted the post of Dean of St. Mary's Cathedral in Johannesburg. We just bought um, a house um, in London, the first house that we ever owned. The children were going to good schools, they were staying at home. Uh, Trevor was just uh, going off to uh, university. The London that I knew as a child was, you know, filled with the Hippodrome and ballet and theatres and musicals and fun, cricket and soccer, you know, and I mean, my 
parents' friends coming over to play, my friends coming to play. And this man says, pack it up, we go home. I thought he was crazy. Then we, we, oh, we argued a lot about this. And she knew that when we returned to South Africa, her children were going to have to be separated from her. He would have to go to boarding schools and just being brought up and under all the pressures of apartheid, I think she found that to be one of the most difficult decisions we ever took. If that didn't lead to a divorce court, I don't think there'd be anything that can really lead to a divorce court because I really was angry with him. I didn't want to come back. I don't think anything could have prepared you for the South Africa to which I came back. I had lived now in, in a different country and knew that things could be different. To come back to being not even a second class citizen, I mean, a third and fourth class would probably more, more aptly cover it. Uh, my children having to suffer as my children did, that also helped to put a little anger in me. If they want to know the direction in which I'm taking the Southern Council of Churches, we are focusing on that homelands policy and the resettlement and uprooting of our people. And let them know that as long as I am around, and as long as that policy is around, I will call for pressure to ensure that that policy is destroyed. It was a time when he was enemy number one. When I say there is nothing they can do to me, and I want to challenge them even today, I say there is absolutely nothing they will do to me which will stop me. There were always going to be incidents under those circumstances. Somebody makes a phone call. They would say to a child as old as Paul at six. You would have thought that they would say, well, call your father or your mother. Uh, they wouldn't. They would just say, we are going to kill your father, you know, and uh, tell him or something, and you could see the child. I used to find that uh, almost unforgivable. The system tries all it can to destroy us. It won't succeed. I want to tell you, it won't succeed. It won't succeed because God God is on our side. For man is free until we are free. And we want you, we want, I keep begging white people, I say, join us. Join the winning side. Join, join the winning side. Sometimes he would be late coming back and each minute uh, you know, set you thinking whether it was arrest, assassination. There was a time when I hoped that uh, if they arrested him, I would at least know. The pamphlets that they would use to distribute about us. You know as well as I do, especially in news, that what you use and the way you use it carries a certain message. The demonization of Desmond Tutu by the then government, at that stage, was done for a specific reason. Today I say it was wrong, and I regret it. I didn't mind they are doing that to me. It was when they tried to get at me by getting at the family that they really made me bristle with anger. I mean, the humiliations that uh, they experienced being handcuffed to, 
two men being paraded through the streets of Johannesburg for an alleged traffic offence. Trevor might not be always uh, <laughs> a blue-eyed boy. With Trevor's humour, he just makes jokes about things. Are you really a Desmond Tutu's son? And Trevor says, well, that's my mother's story. And then Trevor says, the guy was too dim to t catch the joke. <laughs> they were really just penalizing him for, for the fact that he had my surname. I've also got to be perfectly fair and say that, you know, I mean, it isn't as if I was backward and coming forward. Like ourselves are one day going to be pushed aside. The people are going to say nonsense. Those leaders, they keep talking about peace and our people keep getting killed. I think it was uh, Louis Lichrangi uh, said, the trouble with Bishop Tutu is that he talks too much. And I, I said to Leah, what do you think? Do you think I, I am talking too much? But I knew if, if he did quit quiet, he would not be quiet inside. It would just make him explode. And so I said, no, I'm all behind you. I know it hurts, it's difficult, but um, I would rather support you doing what you think is right because I do think it's right what you're doing. I really would rather see you in Robben Island than you dying slowly inside. I've never had the same sense of affirmation that I got from her that day. There are only two ways to freedom in South Africa. The one way is through sitting down and talking, which we say, let us do. The other, and there is no middle way. I, all this is nonsense. I'm for middle way. There are only two options. We either talk or we fight. And I am still saying, we want to help you, South African government, South African whites. We want to help you to talk. We want you to be alive when freedom comes. It was one of the greatest pains for me in the apartheid days to find that I was the ogre for so many in the white community. I really didn't like having to be abrasive and all of that. never had an occasion where I had to keep quiet because I'm Desmond Tutu's wife. She's been able to say when she didn't agree with me. I do have my own opinion and I don't think for one minute that being Desmond Tutu's wife makes me less than normally Zoleya Tutu. Most times during the during the struggle, we really were um, shoulder to shoulder. The birth of our son was one of our happiest moments after our wedding, and then when he was um, honoured with the Nobel Prize. It was a wonderful, wonderful location. And then of the weddings of our children. Following in her father's footsteps, Mpoh was ordained in 2003. As with Tandeka and Naomi, Mpoh lives in the USA. Trevor has set up home in South Africa. Together, they have blessed Desmond and Leah with seven grandchildren. We used to spend an inordinate amount of time taking children to and from school, because the only schools which were available were in Swaziland. 
Rupert's cars then didn't have radios, or maybe the Oppenheimers and the Rupert's did, but certainly the ones that uh, my parents were using did not. And they would sing all the way along and harmonize, you know, old school songs and folk songs and stuff. They just seemed to be able to have fun doing nothing together. What should have been a horrible trial, they managed to turn it into a positive affirmation of their love and their relationship. She, she's tougher. I think she's tougher in many ways than, than, than I am. I think I get my strength from Desmond. I really do get my strength from him. She is more extrovert than I. You can't help uh, being sad when he's sad because he's just openly sad. <laughs>